Thank you, Peter, and uh, hello to everybody. Thank you, Erica, Scott, and Rob for uh, great presentations there. And I'm going to talk now specifically about one aspect, which is community engagement. And I was trying to look for a metaphor for this, and I, I got this photograph from my daughter, who's uh, a great fan of going to Glastonbury to music festivals. And this is the 2010 year, which is the 40th anniversary. When it started in 1970, it was free, and it was come if you want, and it was all very casual. Now, of course, it's still a lot of fun, but it's a big business. And that's a, a very much a metaphor for what's happening in the MROCs, Insight Communities, Community Panel business. When I first got involved in communities back in about 2006, seven years ago, the very first client who came to us said, I'm going to try this. I don't care if it works. I just am curious. The next client who came to us were, wasn't doing it because they're curious. They just felt passionately that they should be having conversations. So it was all about, we want to get in touch with our customer on a two-way relationship. And it was about passion. And that's important. But actually, the market has moved on. Most, and I was doing a piece of research recently, there are now thousands of online communities, insight communities, research communities, MROCs around the world with brands talking to their customers, and nearly all doing it because there is a good business case. We've moved on from new brands doing it because they passionately wanted to, to it being simply done, um, not sim only done, but the driving reason is that it's a really good way of getting in touch, of getting timely information to make better business decisions. And there is a response rate equation in this whole process. Higher response rates mean cheaper research because you don't have to pay such high incentives to get the last bit of the sample. You don't have to spend time chasing around people to complete the surveys. So a higher response rate means that we're going to get the research at a better price. A higher response rate also means faster research. It's predictable. You know how many invitations to send. You know how many people to recruit for a discussion. You know how many people you're going to have to find in order to do that survey. If you know that slightly more men, sorry, slightly more women reply to your invitation than men, well, you're going to invite slightly more men. It becomes predictable. If we start talking about numbers like 50%, all of a sudden the process is much more predictable. And you get better research because whenever you buy a piece of research and the fieldwork company is struggling to fill those last few quotas, just think about what's going on in that process. They are scraping the barrel, and we have all been there, to get those people to fit into those quotas to finish the, re the research. That's not the best research. The best research is where you're able to go to the whole community and say, we're looking for people to help us with this project, with this project, with this project, and you get a high response rate. Then you're, instead of just talking to the few people who are willing to do discussions on anything or surveys on anything, you're talking to the wider base. So engagement is the key tool for a high response rate. A high response rate is the best way to measure engagement. You should certainly have other methods of measuring engagement, but response rate is the absolute best single measure. And the best way to get a high response rate is by having great engagement. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. There are two types of engagement. <clears throat> you want to engage the members of your community, but you want to engage the stakeholders. There's no point just having a community and doing fantastic research and generating wonderful insights if those insights aren't changing the way the organization operates. So we need to engage stakeholders right throughout the organization and beyond into the external organizations. So I'm going to show you engagement really with two more case studies, really hard cases. The first one has got zero customer association, and the second one is B2B, hard to reach C-suite people. So when we look at these two, we can see what we can do with engagement and how we can take those best practices forward. So the first 
CBS Outdoors, and they used to think of themselves as selling space on billboards. But very quickly, of course, they realized that what they're selling are the people walking past billboards. Now, you may think um, at Campbell's, for example, that it's difficult to have a close relationship with your customers because you've got the intermediary, the retailers. But think how difficult it is when the people you're trying to have a relationship with are the people who walk past your signs. That's your only relationship with them. You've got to be creative if you're going to move forward. And CBS wanted to create an urban community in the UK around cities like Birmingham and Manchester and Glasgow and most of all London and to really get in tune with what was happening. So they used their own assets. They created this advertising campaign. It was all over London and Manchester and places like that, in particular on the underground. It started off with just workshopplay.co.uk. And they trailed that for a while, and then they brought a few more pieces in ready for the launch date. And yes, they had to purchase, recruit some of the people in the community. But it was a tremendous jump from their own use of their assets to get people interested because of course these were going to be the right sort of people to have an engagement with. Being brave paid off. Not only did they recruit a lot of people, they've got way over 6,000 members in the community now, but actually, <coughs> sorry about that, um, they were voted website of the day by one of the, the trendy London sites there, Pocket Lint. How cool is that? Your market research project gets voted website of the day. You've got to aim for the stars. If you miss them, you're still going to get the top of the tree. And that's what they were doing at CBS Outdoors. They were aiming for the stars. They were aiming to be genuine entertainment, genuine communication in that process. Here are the sort of comments they got that they were able to look in Twitter to spot. CBS Outdoor UK, loving workshop play. They had me at the hash workshop play.co billboard advertisement. I'll check it out later. CBS Outdoor UK just signed up for the workshop play. Interesting site. Bugging me for weeks on the underground. Finally bothered to check it out. Workshop play. So they're generating real conversation and interest in the site. They then take it forward and they know that these are particularly mobile professionals, young urban living people, people with disposable incomes, people who are commuting into work, these people have got iPads and iPhones. They've got to speak to them in the way that makes sense and keeps them engaged. So they change the topics, they have engaging looking surveys. In context, the people in Manchester get asked questions about Manchester, the people in London get asked questions suitable for London. If there is a campaign running at that time, it matches it. Everything is context sensitive. Feedback, feedback, feedback. They have no other relationship with these people. They have to keep their attention. So they're sending them masses of information back saying, you told us this. This is how that information was used. And they're adding to that other useful information. So if you're in London, here's the sort of things in your area. Time out. Doing exactly the sort of things. Paying the members of the community back with all of this additional information, with this fun stuff on YouTube, keeping a track of it on Twitter. They're sending that feedback through in lots of forms, so you can have it as an email, you can have it on your screen, you can have it in a variety of formats. So that's great. Remember I made that point about engaging the internal stakeholders and the external stakeholders. And this is where I think CBS Outdoors have done a fantastic job, because they produce every single study, they produce tables. And those tables are available to anybody in the business who wants them. Almost nobody looks at them, of course, because they produce an infographic for every study. And if you just want that really quick grab, you're going to take the infographic. If you need the numbers, you've got the numbers. We're in the branding business, aren't we? Really? We work with marketers all the time. But so often, market research deliverables are not branded. Here's a lovely case. Workshop Play operates in those three colors, the blue, the gray, and the red. So their feedback operates in those colors. You can see those across the room on the wall on the other side. You can see them on the desk over there. And all the time you're going to say, yeah, I know that's a workshop play feedback. The only exception is the one um, just about in the middle. Santa Claus coming to town, they pop in a bit of green for Christmas, which again just highlights the accessibility of the information. They're sharing that within the organization, but they're also sharing it 
with their stakeholders. The people who advertise on their billboard are their external stakeholders. They want to get this information into those groups as well. And what they're finding is that they're getting into the trade press now. All of a sudden, they're appearing in these different sort of sites. People are quoting what is going on in workshop play. Workshop play is beginning to have an authority. And one of the things that I would say to anybody running a community is you want to make sure that your community has some real authority internally and externally. You're going to see that even more so in the next case. So the next case, the UK Tutor Directors, created in 1903. It's got 36,000 members. You have to be a director of a listed company to be in there. Now that's got lots of implications. So they've created their community, the Policy Voice, 3,000 members, just over that now. So that's nearly 10% of the total membership of the organization are members of Policy Voice. 85% male, mostly MDs, CEOs, CFOs. 90% 40 to 69 years old. These are difficult people to um, recruit. These are difficult people to get to do surveys. They are highly critical. They are incredibly time poor. So engagement is massively important. How have they done for my, the, what the Institute of Directors have done is engagement through impact. They make the members of this community understand that their views matter. They influence the media. They influence the politicians. The Institute of Directors are called in on a regular basis to go and talk to David Cameron, and they can say, our members say this. And they then feed that information back to members to say, this is what we've said to David Cameron. This is what we've said to George Osborne, who is the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the UK. They produce reports for the members based on the members' views. When they issue these reports, they are reported in the Financial Times, the Telegraph, the Independent, the Daily Mail. As borrowing sores, reading Osborne plans, radical cuts, businesses urge. That businesses urge was a finding from the policy voice. Businesses brace for gloom to continue on the top left. That was a finding from the IOD survey from the policy voice. They are delivering that degree of impact and then going back to the community this is what views can do, and that is tremendously motivating. So there's a sort of credibility and engagement going on here. The first is that they have set themselves a rule that they will never report a study with fewer than a thousand completes. They've only got a three thousand members, remember, but they feel that there is um, something quite significant. It's a bit like a magic number because when we sample the whole population. For opinion polling, we often use 1,000. We say that's accurate, plus or minus 3%. With a smaller community, you don't really need to be quite so big because they're way over 5%. Unless they've set themselves this benchmark, that gives them immediate credibility with the politicians, gives them immediate credibility with the media, and it gives them credibility with their own members who are CFOs, CMOs, CEOs, etc. They are consistently getting a completion rate of over 45%. That's really important. They can say to everybody, this really does represent the views. It's not just a handful of people from the community doing the survey every time. It's a really good cross-section of the membership. This particular community only ever does one survey a month. Um, I'm working with another community in uh, Singapore at the moment, Telco. They've done 160 projects in a year. They've got people doing up to three studies a week, and it suits them. For this audience, for these CFOs, these senior people, one survey a month. It's all about setting the expectations when the community was created. The surveys are still have to be engaging. Now, these people get bored very quickly. The surveys have to be short. They have to be done in an appropriate voice, which is quite technical. It's not very jokey. You don't have sort of laughing pandas as part of the survey but you do make it visually appealing and fun to do and straightforward to do. They pride themselves on reviewing the comments. So they get 1,000 completes. They may get 1,500 comments in the open ends. They read all of those. They will send maybe 600 replies back. Some of those replies are handwritten replies, uh, well, hand-signed replies. Somebody will have typed them from the director general because they need to tell everybody in the community 
every one of you is being listened to, every one of you is being taken seriously. And they produce these very visible reports, uh, vis visible results. They produce reports which for members, they produce press coverage, they can talk about coming out of negotiations with the government, they can point to changes in tax and so on. And recently the, the review of the community with the client, we went through when we got some open ends and here are some slightly interesting and the last one slightly scary verbatims. I feel that I'm given the chance to use my voice in a far more effective way than any other available to me as a businessman. So even CA, CEOs and CFOs feel that they need some way of expressing their voice more strongly. Taking part has provided me with the opportunity to take a closer look at my company from angles that I might not normally examine the business from. They're finding they're getting something from the process just by being involved. And this is the, um, certainly for me, the slightly scary one. Policy voice lets me have more say in what matters to me than my vote in a general election does. The reason that's scary is that it's true. In an election, they're one of 60 million people. Here, they're one of 3,000 people in policy voice, and their voice is being taken to number 10 Downing Street. So that really is a very motivating force. However, it doesn't matter what type of community you've got, you could be using that community. You could be going to your retailers, to your Woolworths and your Coles, and really talking about customers. You could be going to the media, you could be going to the, the Queensland government and saying, this is what people in this area really think. Because once you've got an engaged community, once you've got a high response rate, you can really go out there and do this engagement through impact. So here are my six tips for engagement. The first one is you have to have a plan. Um, I know that we've got at least one, one client on the line and at least one client on the panel, but I, I have to say sometimes clients go missing. They lead busy lives and so you create a community and sometimes there simply isn't an activity that week or that month. So if you've got a forward plan and you say, right, we're going to do and this engagement study here, we're going to do this study about green activities here, we're going to do this study about left hand versus right hand at some point, because you want some fun things in most of those communities. They're in the plan. If a real project comes, it's easy. It just bumps it. But if something doesn't come, then we work through the plan. We know when we're going to do the health checks. We know when we're going to do this. Even in a three-week activity, you still need a day-by-day -day plan so that you're sure that something is going to happen and that you are going to finish the project on time. You need to measure your engagement and set targets. So you should be looking at whatever your response rate is. And if it's not 45% or 50%. You need to be saying, well, over the next year, year and a half, how do we get there? If the last two week M had a rate of X, you need how are you going to improve that? We need to define what we mean by response rate. Is it joined in a conversation once? Is it joined in every conversation? Is it the depth of comments? All of these things we need to determine, we need to be measuring them. We need to be looking at how many people drop out, drop out before the end of a project and all of these sort of issues and consistently been driving the standard up. We've got to engage community members and we've got to engage stakeholders. So if you do a newsletter to people in your community, send it to all of your colleagues. Tell them this is what we are talking about. Produce those infographics for the business. Simplify the information. Please, please, please don't just send on tables and issues like that. Nobody's going to be interested. Everybody who works for your bank, everybody who works for your retailer, everybody who works for your FMCG brand should know that you're having a conversation with customers, whether that's a three-week conversation or a 12-month conversation. You really need to engage the whole organization. Yes, you should be doing the obvious, engaging surveys, newsletters, uh, videos, personalities, all these sorts of things are really important. But beyond that, vary the task. Don't keep asking people to do the same stuff. Sometimes ask them to do really tricky things. Give them the option of not doing it, but ask them to keep a diary for a week. Ask them to take a photograph of every meal they eat. Ask them to go in and to put on their favorite clothes out of their wardrobe and, to, and get someone to take a picture of them and to upload it. Things that go a little bit further, 
because it mustn't just be your grandma's research. You really want to be effective, engaging, and pushing boundaries. People don't join communities because they want to do the same old, same old. So we've got to keep moving the, the wheel forward. Target task the right respondents. Now, I talk about response rates like 45% and 50%. Part of that is done by removing people who don't respond from the community, not from the population. Part of that is done by sending the right invitations. So don't ask men to do a women-only survey. If people have said to you they're interested in A but not B, send them surveys about A. So that is part of the response rate process. It's about predictability. It's not about fiddling the numbers. You're saying that from the people that we have selected and we've taken some effort to select the right people, we are getting this predictable high response rate that makes the research cheaper, faster, and better. Thank you very much. That's my two pennyworth. Penny worth.